HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. Somewhere out there, there's a man on a park bench eating his 500th PB&J. He has no idea Papa John's has new papadillas that are way better than a boring sandwich. With Papa John's best meats, cheeses, and veggies hand-folded into a crispy flatbread crust. Someone better tell that man. Get a new papadilla in one of four flavors for just six bucks. Better ingredients, better pizza, better than a sandwich. Papa John's. Not valid with discounts, fees, and taxes. Extra prices may vary. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth with your host, Diane Helbig. Diane is a leading small business development and leadership coach, author, and speaker who is passionate about sharing valuable ideas, tips, and techniques with business professionals worldwide. Diane brings you the world's experts and gurus in all things business, whether it's sales, structure, social media, planning, or plateauing, guests bring their expertise and energy to each episode. When growing your business is your focus, Accelerate Your Business Growth is the show to listen to. Got a topic or guest suggestion? Let Diane know. The goal is to make sure you have the information you need to move your business forward. Thanks for joining us. Settle in and enjoy. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining me. Today's podcast is sponsored by audible.com and we are offering a free trial. You can go to audibletrial.com slash business growth, sign up for that trial and then go exploring the, you know, the audiobooks, but also the other content that's there. If you feel like it, reach out to me and let me know what you think. I would be curious. Uh, this podcast uh, continues to enjoy inclusion on lists of the best podcasts to listen to. And that is because of the guests. Uh, These are folks who have expertise in particular. And they join me for a conversation where they share that expertise with all of you. Today is no exception. My guest today is Darren Gallup. Darren is a business leader and security professional with over 20 years of experience as a CEO and a CISO of companies that handle sensitive data. Currently, he's the CEO and co-founder of Securacy. Darren's unique perspective enables him to lead organizations through the process of baking security into their business practices while improving productivity. Thanks so much for joining me today, Darren. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, you know, every time I feel like... um, Cyber cybersecurity, you know, is a topic. It it seems like it is always a timely topic because there's always something going on <laughs> that we need to be aware of. That is true. So, um, so I'm, I want to ask you a couple questions, and I would like to know. 
why cybersecurity is so important for business owners? Well, I think it's important to understand that cybercrime is now estimated to be the largest black market industry in the world. So we're talking about comparing to the illicit drug trade, um, weapons trade, and so on. So it's it's pretty big business. And, you know, essentially, a lot of it is just a lot easier than any other criminal activities in the past have been for, for a profit purpose. So if you think about the drug trade, you know, you have to, you're taking a lot of risks. Um, you could get caught. You, you're trusting a lot of people. People know stuff. You're traveling with narcotics, all these types of things. And in the cyber world, you can attack anyone anywhere on the, on, in the world, as long as you have internet and they are accessible um, via technology, communication, telephone, internet, et cetera. So, you know, it really has evolved very quickly. That also with all, all of the things we do online now compared to even where, where we were five or 10 years ago, um, almost every business is online in some degree, whether they're a, a software company or a service company or a manufacturing company, they're leveraging the, the internet, they're leveraging cloud computing, um, they have servers, they have networks, they have people with, uh, you know, that have access to a lot of data. So that's certainly one, uh, you know, big element that growth in criminal activity for profit, which is motivating um, hackers to become hackers. And when you combine that with a lot of a lot of fallout financially or economically from a pandemic, and you have people in desperate times, desperate times lead to desperate measures. So we're seeing a big uptick in that already growing uh, criminal activity um, since the pandemic has has sort of you know re havoc on, on people's lives. And so, you know, on top of that, you also have government reaction um, in terms of, you know, just looking at the impact of what a lot of these breaches can have on individuals. So government now is getting involved with where we see a lot of privacy legislation popping up globally. So I think most most common or most popular privacy regulation that, that most people hear of is GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation that comes out of Europe. Uh, and that was certainly promoted very heavily, both by the legal community, but also by every cybersecurity and compliance and privacy company on the planet that was seeing it as an opportunity to um, you know, increase awareness and increase fear and monetize that. So I think everybody's aware of, of GDPR, but we're also seeing more GDPR-like legislation popping up in other parts of the world. So Canada has a privacy legislation that, that dates some time ago that they've recently made uh, some substantial updates to. We saw the, the California um, Act, the CCPA, that popped up not that long ago. And there's a whole bunch of other states that are currently working on and launching their own uh, you know, state uh, regulations. So you have the privacy landscape there. And of course, with privacy, you're thinking a lot about people and personal information, personal identifiable information, health data, things like that. And so with that, that, that creates another pressure on business because obviously you can't, you, can't, you can't create, you can't have privacy if you don't have security. So if you have a great privacy policy and you, and you follow some good internal practices, but your web application that's hosting thousands of records of personally identifiable information of American or Canadian or European citizens, what have, you if that's not secure then that privacy is not real because a, a hacker can just come in there and, and hack the the web application access the database and there goes all that data and once it's out as we know it's not coming back and so you know those are factors that play in part as well and then the other factor where where i see a lot of of, of small businesses really starting to take security seriously is if they're selling B2B, we're seeing a, a lot of pushback on, on midsize and, and enterprise organizations to hire a small business for anything if they're not able, if that small business is not able to demonstrate that they have a strong security posture um, and that they're taking privacy seriously. They have a privacy program in their, their organization. 
Um, and that is happening. Uh, I mean, it's almost impossible now. If you're a SaaS company, a software as a service company selling to, you know, a big box store or a financial institution or, you know, really any um, large organ or large or sophisticated organization, you're going to likely get a security questionnaire asking you anywhere from 20 to 300 questions about the practices and the security measures that you have internally. They're going to want to see policies, procedures. They're going to want to see some proof that you're actually doing that. They may even require you to have a certified uh, compliance, uh, you know, a certification of your compliance uh, from a third party. They're probably going to look for penetration tests, things like that. So, you know, there's a lot of things that are happening that are making it very quickly, um, not an option. Uh, You know, I used to say four or five years ago that it could be thought of as a competitive edge. And I do think that that still is the case. But I honestly think we've really quickly caught up to the point where it's 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 almost becoming a license to do business. So so very hard for businesses to actually have access to any data, touch any data of customers uh, without having some measures uh, deployed within their organization. Wow. So, uh, okay, so a small business owner is listening to this and, and they're feeling like, okay, I get it. And cybersecurity just feels daunting to me. What advice would you give them? Well, I think if you look at cybersecurity and go through every one of its domains um, and every single thing you could do to protect your company, it's, it is very daunting. I, I won't, uh, you know, I, I won't, I won't lie to you there. And, and it also, there's, there's added confusion with, a lot of acronyms and a lot of lingo. And there's even cases of inconsistency of, of how, you know, what terms mean or, or what people call things in some areas, certainly geographically or industry wide. And then you have a whole bunch of different secure cybersecurity frameworks or standards um, that, that, you know, all have similar intent, um, which is to give you a, a, a framework or a standard to benchmark and to guide uh, security deployment, but it gets pretty confusing when 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 you're you know presented to this stuff initially. Um, I think the the most important thing, especially a smaller business, and and if they're in that sort of ground zero position, is 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 some they they need to learn a little bit of information about um, you know what is what is risk. For example, they have to take an understand, they have to learn to understand what it is they have in their business. What are the data points? Like what stuff are they touching? How are they interacting with data? Who has access to that data? Where is it going? And they have to learn some basic sort of understanding of sort of, you know, what the risk profile is today. And when I say a risk profile at a very high level, what I mean is, okay, I'll give you an example. Let's, I'll look at my business and I have a web application in the cloud. It's a software as a service and there's data stored in a multi-tenant database in the AWS environment. So when we do our risk assessment, we consider, hey, that data is all our customer data. So what would happen if the confidentiality of that data was to be violated? In other words, somebody was to access and it became public domain Um, You know, and I look, we look at that and we go, oh no, that would be a big problem. And then, you know, try to understand and quantify that problem. Um, What would it cause, what would it cost us to fix it? Would we, could we possibly get sued? What, what, what could it do to our sales traction and our, our churn rates and things like that, right? So, you know, and when we look at it from an integrity perspective, how important is the accuracy of that data? And if something were to happen, whether it's caused internally or externally, that would violate or alter that accuracy and alter the integrity of that information, um, what would that impact be? And then, you know, we do the same thing from av- availability. Some companies provide products or services where availability or uptime is a key uh, factor and, and you could potentially uh, be in violation of a contract or, or cause significant financial harm if something happened that made it that your systems or services were not able to be utilized by your customer for a prolonged period of time, which you know could be an hour, could be two days, could be a week, depending on your business. So really looking at your business and thinking about it from that understanding of what are the what are the assets, what are the data sets, what are the processes, what are the things we're doing that are critical, and look at it through that that sort of confidentiality, integrity, integrity and availability, which in security is referred to as the CIA tri- triad. So that's a really good starting point. 
Now, generally speaking, if you're at ground zero and you don't have any cybersecurity experience, you're going to need a little bit of help. Sure, you could do it on your own. The, the internet is a fabulous infinite resource pool where you can learn anything, but you're going to spend a lot of time figuring things out. And, and if you don't have a, a sort of an introductory, at least understanding of what's applicable, what's appropriate to your business, you're very likely going to end up burning a lot of time and getting caught up on things that may not be critical for you in your business. So, so that's, you know, that's, that's where I would say the starting point is. And then as a second to that, and one of the things we say to all our customers is it's not realistic that in a couple of months, you're going to be, in the absolute like state of security of, of, of maturity with everything in your business protected. So when you look at that, when you, that's why this risk sort of understanding of your risk is critical. Cause if you look at all the elements of your business and understand all the various areas of risk in your business, where you should start are the most priority ones. Um, and, and even sometimes looking at the, the, the priority and, and the lift. So there's a lot of things that you can do very easily with, with little to no cost that can drastically improve security. So, you know, we, we try to think about that in that sense. What can we do this month that will substantially improve the security position or the security posture of your business versus getting overwhelmed with everything? And, and I see this all the time. I see these, these, these companies spend three months trying to figure out what it is they're actually going to do and how they're going to do it. Okay. And it's, and it, whereas they could have actually, they could have actually had a massive impact of their security posture. If they had to just, you know, let's not figure everything out today. Let's understand what we have, what our exposures are, what our risk is, and let's pick the top most important thing that that exercise articulates to us. And let's secure that thing. Like, so, so that's, you know, that would be the way I would think about it is, is thinking about understanding your business, understanding the basics of security, and then figuring out a priority and being able to break it up in a, in a way that's, that's logical. Now, obviously, um, if you wait until you have customers requiring you to meet sophisticated security requirements like, a, you know, compliance with the, the SOC 2 trust principles or, or ISO 27001 or the U.S. government's NIST 800-171 or something like that, if, if you wait until a customer asks you for that and you're at ground zero, that, can, that could potentially put you in, in a position where you, you, you could be jeopardizing sales there because you kind of have a you know an obligation to move very quickly which certainly is more daunting and generally would be more expensive than if you start thinking about it before you have uh you know you really are in that 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 sort of fire seat um with a customer well and and they should be doing it anyway just you know whether they're going to have customers who require it or not you're right they should but as, as an entrepreneur, as a startup <laughs> founder, and I've been an entrepreneur and a startup founder longer than I've been an information security professional. So I would say if I was to rate my experience in one over the other, I've got more experience as an entrepreneur. And when I started to learn about risk and understand how to apply the concept of risk in these, these sort of CIA um, concepts to, to a startup, to my last startup, to, essentially, what I realized for most of the startups is your biggest risk is you're going to run out of money before you hit product market fit and are able to either meet profitability or raise your next round of capital. So um, when you think about risk and, and as an entrepreneur being laser focused sometimes, um, our biggest concern is, is not whether or not our you know, obscure company of four or five employees that very few people have heard about gets hacked. Um, it's more what's a more real feeling to most entrepreneurs is 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 around failure in other aspects of the business because in most smaller or younger businesses almost every aspect or asset of your business is not in its at its maturity yet and, and so you don't have systems and processes for for things people are sort of going you know people are wearing four or five hats priorities are changing often People are working long hours. They're, they may not be getting the rest and the, the diet and the exercise that, that, that your doctor would probably recommend um, that, you would, that you should have. So in the context of sort of all the other risk and all the other challenges and all the other competing um, elements or competing, the things that are competing for budget, 
it's it, I think it's really hard for a founder to prioritize security very easily um, at, at that earlier stage. I'm going to take a quick sponsor break and then I have some more questions for you. Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast is happy to be sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken digital audio entertainment and information. They have thousands of titles to choose from, as well as podcasts, Audible originals, guided meditations, and more. One of my favorite audiobooks is Everyone Deserves a Great Manager by Scott Miller. For me, I love being able to listen to it anywhere and across my devices without losing my place. And I think you will too. So visit audibletrial.com slash business growth to explore the variety of audiobooks and programs for yourself. Yeah, I, I, that, that's right. So, and you mentioned, um, you know, getting hacked before. So, so what should a company do like immediately if they do get hacked, what, what should they do? Well, it's, it, it does depend on how you've been hacked, like what has actually happened um, and, and what's at stake. But on a high level, if you have, I refer to it as a security incident. And when I talk about a security incident, getting hacked is certainly a security incident. An attempt mm -hmm. of being hacked is a, is a security incident because it indicates mm -hmm. intent that somebody's, you know, they're doing something or have done something and they, that may be part of something else or, you know, a first attempt or whatnot. But, you know, also a lot of times security incidents, especially in software companies are actually caused accidentally and internally. Um, I've seen very many cases in my career of a, of a startup um, deploys, you know, a, a developers working, working, working hard to meet a deadline for a customer and they deploy a piece of code that they've tested to the best of their ability, quote unquote. Um, and then all of a sudden now customers are seeing things they shouldn't see. Um, so, you know, a lot of when we talk about security incidents, yes, there's the hackers on the external, but there's also thinking about protecting yourself from yourself and, and from accidents and from errors and that, that can happen internally. So when we have an incident, generally... To, to be prepared for an incident would be to have a, a, a security team or a, a, an incident response disaster recovery team. In enterprise world, in large organizations, these are generally different teams, but obviously in a small business, it's very much going to be, very likely going to be one team, the security teams, you know, who's your security team? Those three people over there. Who's your disaster recovery team? Those people. Who's the incident response people? <laughs> Those three people over there. You, you, you get it, right? And so- yeah. You know, having a team of people and, 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 you know, in that team, making sure that you have um, somebody in there that has a deep and intimate understanding of your tech stack, whether that is, you know, your internal technology, if you're a software company or a technical company, or the tools and the administration of the tools that you use, if you're, say, a service provider, you should also have somebody there who, who can represent marketing and messaging and communication. So, um, you know, generally when you have an incident, there's a high degree of likelihood that you're going to have to communicate the bad news to folks. That may be legal requirement, maybe an ethical thing. Um, you also need to make sure that you have somebody who has ex some experience in incident response. So it's not uncommon to get um, ex external help. Uh, especially, you know, if it's your first incident, it's a very good thing to have some external help. You may also need legal assistance, depending on, on you know, the, 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 the scope of what happens. And, and so when we look like internally in my company, if we have an, if we have an incident of some, of some manner, we have a reporting process where any employee can report an incident. We also have automated tools that can detect incidents or peculiar behavior that could be indicative of an incident. We have people that are always on call to respond and, and, and check on these things. So that's kind of the first thing. Somebody sees something weird, odd, peculiar. Okay, they pull the fire alarm. Somebody with that, that's from that security team reviews that, looks into it quickly to see, hey, is this a real incident? Is this a false positive? What's going on? Um, and then based on what they discover, if it is a real incident, they'll call the team together. And if the team is well prepared, they've already looked at their risk assessment. They've also, they've already taken consideration of 
the things that could go wrong in their business, that the, the types of incidents that could happen. And they've already documented some form of an incident response plan or a disaster recovery plan. So they already have gone through some measures um, where they've, you know, sort of plan for these things um, proactively. So they're not acting in duress and panic and, you know, randomly calling everybody they know that might be able to help them. Although that is unfortunately what I see a lot. A lot of people are unprepared. They didn't expect it. All of a sudden they find out all their systems are locked, their computers are locked. Um, and they're going to lose data if they don't move, you know, some amount of money in Bitcoin in 24, 48 hours, whatever, um, you know, so, and they don't have a plan, they don't really have a team and they're, they're you know, it just turns into a lot of chaos. So every incident is different. Sometimes you may have an incident where there's a large volume of personal identifiable information. Um, that can be some, you know, a very bad case scenario because especially if you're a global company or you're, or you're a data processor or you're storing data on behalf of a global entity, that may mean uh, a whole bunch of regulatory reporting where you are required now to report your breach to regulatory bodies. Um, each one may have a different process or contact method or reporting method, a different timeline, whether it's immediate or 24 hours or 72 hours, um, you know, you, you're, you're, you really can get yourself into a lot of trouble very quickly. If you have a breach that has, you know, a large volume of, of person identifiable information in there. So uh, wow. yeah, it's not a situation when you, when you, that you want to be in. Um, um, it's, it's inevitable at some point, every company will have some form of a security incident, but if you have the right controls in place and, and you build a proper security program, um, and you, you sort of pair that with it, with a competent security team, a little bit of upskilling and, and some process, some thought put into it, not only do you reduce, uh, the impact and, and, re and improve your ability to respond to an incident, you also just substantially reduce the likelihood that an incident is going to happen. Hmm. Boy, that, that is really valuable. And, and you said something earlier about, um, internal, you know, that, that things have internally. And, and I've been wanting to ask you this question because it feels like a lot of times what happens is an employee does something, like they open something or they click on something or, or, or whatever, uh, thinking that it's real, you know, not, not in any sort of malicious way. But it seems to me that one of the hardest things for founders to do is impress upon their staff the importance of not doing certain things or, you know, slowing down, questioning, whatever it is, is that, I mean, do you find that to be true? And, and is there advice that you would get, do you have ideas for what founders could do to, to make that impression on their employees? Yeah, I th you know, you're, you're totally, you're totally on point there. Most security breaches or incidents have some form of social engineering. In other words, somebody's tricking somebody into believing something is real, whether that be filling out a form or clicking on a link or downloading a file or, or whatever that is. Um, so that is a very common practice. And there's a couple of things you can do to, to I mean, obviously awareness training and testing people. So there's a lot of tools out there now that do a phishing simulation, for example, where you can have realistic looking emails come from known providers that, you know, that you can tailor to your, um, your, your employees to see which individuals already sort of have that skill set and, and have the ability to, to, to discern between real and not real. Uh -huh. Um, the awareness training is a big component, but what I find even with awareness training, if people don't really care or take it seriously or understanding or understand sort of why they need to do this, then it, it generally kind of has a potential of going in one ear and out the other. So yeah. a couple of things that I think are really, really Im impactful for people to understand why th the exercises of doing fishing simulations and awareness training and things like that are, are critical I think the, the first one is to really understand the criminal activity. And, and sometimes the criminal stories can be exciting. We all love watching crime. Um, you know, most people <laughs> like hearing about like really interesting criminal activity. It's kind of 
you know, a topic that's generally more, more interesting than uh, go, spending a workshop on how to harden your MacBook, for example, uh, for your average non-technical employee. So, you know, understanding, showcasing some examples of companies that look somewhat like your company and things that have happened to them and, 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 and sort of how the social engineering component was a piece of it. Um, I also believe that most of the practices that you will want to get your employees to follow and the awareness you want them to have to protect your business also applies to protecting their own home and family. So that's another, uh, another articulation or perspective that I think is worth uh, expressing when you're sort of initiating this training and this, you know, articulating that importance is articulating, you know, examples as well of, of how people have have been, uh, you know, how people have been hacked and the problems that individuals have had based on hackers' activity. So sort of making it real um, and, and being able to articulate and share some stories. So I think that's a really big piece. And then tying it to their, their, to their uh, employee reviews and their performance evaluations. So really articulating it in the sense of it is a, it's not an option. This is not like something we're doing once a year as a lunch and learn. This is a thing that you have, it's in your employee contract or it's in your policies and there's, there's clear articulated disciplinary action. If you fail to take this seriously and you fail to, to you know, provide, follow proper due care and due diligence, in this practice. Um, so those are all really big ones. And then the other one that I always tell CEOs, founders, leadership team is it's really critical to lead by example. Um, you see a lot, I see a lot of cases where you see organizations have very strict security measures, but then the CEO feels for some reason that it's not critical that, that he or she uh, need to follow, um, you know, all of these things. So then, you, you know, you see people in the team go, oh, well, you know, there goes Dare and he just left his laptop open with all the files accessed and went to the bathroom and then got caught up in a phone call and went for lunch and, you know, left his laptop in the elevator or bathroom or something, you know, like these, the, the, these types of activities, right? So making it, making it something, uh, you know, to lead by example and, 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 and creating and clarifying the expectation of the management team in an organization to be leading and taking this uh, taking this seriously and making and leading that example. Those are all sort of the, the key strategies that I think articulate it. And then if you if you articulate and, and you make it clear that there's going to be testing of this over time and, and there won't be a heads up, you, the heads up is now at any random time over the year, there will be events, there will be quizzes, there will be activities that will be testing to ensure that, that, that you guys have learned the, 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 the stuffs and you're able to put that those learnings to, to activity in your day-to-day -day operations uh, and, and failure to perform reasonably in those tests will be reviewed in, in the context of that employer review. So that understanding that that testing is going to happen and doing that testing, all those activities together will dramatically change the, the sort of the human security element, right? So, and if you do that, and if you have a team of people that are aware and are thinking about security, and you are you're creating clarity around the importance of security in the business. You will notice that it, your your team, your entire team, will be an extension of your security posture in your business. And I see it in my business all the time. Somebody's designing a thing, and um, they go, "Oh, well, we're going to be we're going to be adding all this new confidential information to our platform because of this integration. Uh, what do we need? Like, so you see people seeing." thing happen and because they know that these types of data are important and that they require measures and there's all this stuff that they're being taught then they they instantly kind of pull the alarm and go hey well we're, we're scoping out a thing in, in the design department and realize that in order to do x we need to collect y so like uh let's let's do let's let's have a discussion and document this and essentially perform a risk assessment and understand what are we doing how is it working? Are we designing this in an intelligent way? Are we collecting all the data we need? Are we collecting too much data? Uh, are we collecting it just because we think, that, just things like that, right? You're gauging in this sort of idea that you're, you're now of a security culture. And that stems what's one of the most important things that you can do. And, and, and one of the things that can alleviate a lot of the cost in securing your business is thinking about security and privacy by design. So by having your entire team and every facet of your business have a basic high level understanding of 
what data security is for your business, what data privacy means to your business, everything that they do. And with that consciousness and with that awareness, it, it, it helps ensure that you're, you're, you're thinking about the security and the privacy repercussions from every, in every decision you make versus, you know, the UX guy working with, um, you know, a couple of customers or a couple of customer success people to, to come up with a feature idea, scoping that out, designing it, sending it off to your dev team, your dev team builds it, and then you security test afterwards to figure out, oh, well, now we're going to have to restructure this thing. and We can't use this plugin because of this. And, and you know, it, it saves you a lot of time if you think about things and you, and you can establish that importance. You think about and establish um, security and privacy as a pillar in your business in the same way most businesses think about customer success or sales. Right. As you were talking about that, I, I was realizing that that's what you mean. Like when I was reading your bio and it's, you know, baking security into the strategy and the, you know, operation of the business so that it, like what people have to realize is this really has to be a part of the whole culture and thought process and awareness on a consistent basis. It can't be like this, oh, there's the IT department. Well, you're totally right. And, and, and way too often, um, executives, CEOs, founders, business owners go, oh, cyber, okay, that's an IT thing. Pass <laughs> out the IT and move on. And yes, there are a lot of aspects of cybersecurity and data privacy that are going to fall on those responsible for the IT resources in the organization. However, it's not everything. And there are a lot of components that are going to be governance, that are going to be administrative, that are going to be human resource related, um, and so yes. on. So it, it, it and, and I, you know, I, I, I see that a lot. I see, um, you know, in a lot of startups, it becomes the CTO's responsibility until they get big enough that there's a CIO or, or, a, or a CISO. Um, also, another bad thing, or, you know, bad thing, bad thing, <laughs> kind of not the right term, but a, a naive practice that I see happen is, okay, we're going to hire somebody to deal with all of this. So, okay, so hiring an external expert to help you bring up, like to build your security program and, and build up the knowledge and awareness and, and, and understanding of risk and, and incident management across your executive team, uh, helping you secure your digital app, all of these things, getting help, getting outside help to do this is, is, a, is a, I highly recommend it. Um, I, I think that if you get the right help and you approach it properly, it's going to save you substantially um, in, in the time you will waste of critical people in your business that could be otherwise closing deals or improving products and, and whatnot. But, but where the naivety re resides is, it, it, it's, you're, you, you can't pass off the leadership entirely. You can't yeah. pass it off in a sense where you don't have to, you're not gonna spend any time or learn anything or be able to talk about it. A, if you're selling, and I have a lot, of, you know, a lot of customers that are small, 10, 15, 20 person companies that are selling a product to a massive hotel chain or a, max, a massive uh, you know, box store retailer or you know, an Amazon or Disney. And, and they are not, they, they're gonna wanna make sure that if they, they, they can interview the CTO of the team and that CTO is able to talk with confidence artic in an articulate manner about their actual security posture. So if that CTO answers is in a call with the customer and the customer says, you know, what are you guys doing to manage vulnerability, uh, vulnerability and patching in your code base? If, if, that, if he or she responds with something along the lines of, oh yeah, we got something in place. I don't remember what it is or how often we <laughs> do it. And I've heard that answer a lot. Right? And it's like, okay, well, that's not the right answer. <laughs> I would say to customers, <laughs> don't ever say that again, please. For your own sake, let's, let's, Go figure out what you do. Bring it back to me. Let's go through it, see if it's real. And then let's make sure that you can talk about it. And, and, and most of the time when you can't, when that CTO goes in and tries to dig up what they're doing, it, they come back with, well, that's, yeah, that's not it. 
that's not suitable. Uh, that's not yeah. the right thing. You know, sure, you're doing a, you've got a, 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 a tester that's doing the, you know, dynamic testing of your code base or something. Sure, that's a great thing. And it, and it, and it is a control or it is an activity that can protect from certain things, but that's not what was being asked. And your inability to 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 talk about it or understand the difference is really just going to be concerning for your customer because it demonstrates where security is in priority in the organization, and it means that you've got a chief technical officer that's unable to talk about the technical controls that are protecting the IT environment, even at a high level, and they're not even able to decipher between you know key things like a vulnerability test is not a penetration test and you know things like that so you you can't you can't pass it off you can certainly get help and you can certainly bring outside help in and i think it's a really it's a really wise um approach to it but you can't go into that with the attitude that you're just passing this mess off to somebody and then they're miraculously in the background while you're not thinking about it or doing one single thing about it. They're going to miraculously bring your company to have the pro, uh, an IT security or a, a, a data security posture that is suitable for your business. Um, it's not a realistic expectation. Yeah. Wow. That, that's really <clears throat> valuable. Thank you. Um, what do you. What do you predict for 2021? What are we in for? Oh, it's, I mean, <laughs> don't mean to be negative, but we're living in, in some pretty uh, yeah. shifty times. Yeah. Um, we've got, there's a lot of anger in the world. There's a, a lot of divide. There is a lot of misinformation. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of income disparity between people, you know. There's people that have millionaires that are unhappy and there's people that can't afford to feed their kids. And there's, you know, a lot of inequality in the world and that anger and that divide and that inequality. um, I think with the speed at which we are all migrating to almost entirely virtual work environments, the speed at which we're adopting cloud and new technology and innovations being de- deployed into market combined with that disparity, I think you're going to just see a hell of a lot more cyber crime. Wow. It's, it, it, I mean, I mean, this is, that's yeah. an easy prediction. I mean, this is not, yeah. this is, there's, there's very few people in the cybersecurity space that aren't, I mean, it's a kind of a no brainer. So I'm not being, I'm not looking at any magical crystal ball by saying that that's just, that is just the nature of, of, of what has been happening year over year for many years. And, and it's just going to keep growing um, at that nature. The things that I would say, it's easier. So on top of the demand, so when I say the increase in demand that, that I believe is happening out there, that, that demand is, is from that income disparity or that loss of income entirely or poverty. The fact that you can go, have, you, you have a laptop and an internet connection and some time and you don't have to be a genius software developer. You don't have to be a genius to, to be good at hacking. I mean, yes, there are geniuses out there and, and, and they're able to do things that the average hacker can't. But you now have the ability. There's also things like ransomware as a service. So you can actually go on the dark web and find a tool that operates very much like a HubSpot or a Salesforce, a, you know, a web-based, a web-hosted application that you can go that has you know, self-serve, you can set yourself up and you have tools to go out and start crypto locking businesses and, um, you know, taking ransom and doing all those things. You can buy databases of stolen data, um, you know, massive databases and, and use that for whatever you want. I mean, you know, in Canada, we have the Canada Revenue Agency. You get, everybody's getting phone calls from the Canada Revenue Agency. The same thing's happening in the U.S. with what you guys, you guys have the, is it the IRA? Um, Am I saying that right? But you guys are having, is that the, what's the uh, revenue agency? Oh, IRS. You're right. IRS, yeah. sorry. Yeah. yeah. yeah so good. the, the, you know, you're, you're getting, oh, you're getting, yeah. people are buying massive databases with names, phone numbers, addresses of, of millions and millions of citizens. 
there's even cases that the Canadian government in in alliance with Interpol and and the and India uh, the police forces in India took down to like absolute call centers like think about it, you walk into a call center and there's all these people working on cubicles like call centers that are wow. set up using relatively modern technology with built scripts trained people employees and all they're doing is ripping off North Americans Ugh. um so you know it is it is it is it's easier to do now there's all kinds of you can get all the information and all the tools you need you could literally buy a laptop spend you know a couple of weeks figuring some stuff out make a plan start hacking and then as you do more yeah. you practice you improve upon yourself just like anything else and really it it's it's it is very hard to get caught so there's all kinds of tactics yeah. and methods that you can uh, you can hide and if you're careful, you can just keep doing it and not get caught, right? So um, that's what we're going to see. We're going to see that. The other thing we're going to see is, and, and again, um, no crystal ball here. This is a lot of continuation of what we saw go on over 2020 and, and even in the years leading up to. Um, you're going to see an increase in regulatory requirements, which is hard for businesses because oh, I don't wow. feel that regulatory bodies do a great job at making things palatable and comprehensible necessarily uh, when they develop regulations that businesses need to follow when it comes to things like security and privacy. All right. Um, so you're going to see more of that and you're going to see heightened scrutiny from, from your customers. So we're seeing it like we help a lot of our customers go through these security due diligence exercises and we see the security questionnaires that they get and the security addendums or elements that are becoming uh, table stakes in contracts that are articulating very specific requirements that, that an organization needs to follow. So those th that scrutiny is becoming more aggressive. I remember it four or five years ago, a lot of times it seemed like it was a general counsel driven exercise of compliance and felt very punctuation, like, you know, making sure you have documents and processes and checking boxes. Now what I'm seeing in addition to that is, is it being embedded into a contractual obligation and that there would be somebody calling your organization and having an interview with whoever is going to own that security and privacy function yeah the business or the people that are owning that and, and actually going in and digging in and, and establishing a risk score on your business. So really exercising due care and due diligence. In other words, they actually care yeah. <laughs> substantially about understanding what risk you expose them to. And they're going to go back to the, the, the decision makers of whether, you know, to whether or not they work with your business or not to establish if the gain from the, the engagement is worth the risks that they've discovered in that process. So, okay. you're, and, and I remember when I started in cyber, it used to be the large sophisticated corporate entities that were putting organizations through this process. I have companies now that are 50 people that are asking, that are sending along fairly significant security questionnaires and are taking this process wow. seriously. So I, I think, you know, everybody who's been selling to in the FinTech space, um, people, you know, PCI DSS has been around forever. People have been selling into health tech or health, uh, healthcare and, and, yeah. and having required, required to follow HIPAA compliance. Those things have been around for a long time. What's really new though is, you know, five years ago, if you were selling to mid market or smaller businesses, no, you really weren't going to get too much pushback or pressure or diligence that you'd be pushed through from a security or privacy perspective. That is changing rapidly. And that, mm. that will continue to evolve over 2021 as well. Wow. Crazy. I really appreciate this information. I, I it, it is uh, invaluable and uh, tremendously timely. Um, Darren, will you share with the listeners, you know, how they can find you and what yes, you've got going on? Absolutely. So um, you can go to our website, securacy.com. It's basically the word security, only we changed the T to a C. <laughs> um, so yeah, securacy.com. Um, you can reach out to, to the team there. Um, and, and, you know, I'm happy to talk to anybody who, who wants, to, you know, wants to learn more. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, we, you know, we specialize in helping small to medium sized businesses 
that store or process information, build an appropriate security program, make sure that they can manage, maintain that program, and then giving them the ability to have not only the tools and the reports to demonstrate their security posture and their privacy compliance to their customers, but also the skills to be able to talk to it in a meaningful and an assuring way. That's fabulous. Boy, and so necessary. Thank you so much. And listeners, <clears throat> thank you. You are who we're doing this for. And this was really an incredibly valuable um, episode. I'd also like to thank our sponsor. Head over to audibletrial.com slash business growth. Sign up for that free trial and go exploring. And you can get your sales strategy headed in the right direction uh, by picking up a copy of Succeed Without Selling wherever books are sold. As always, continue to prosper and be curious. And until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. Me, 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 but also you. <laughs> the Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film, Pip, 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 Powder Donut. <clears throat> okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the name your price tool from Progressive. Oh man, that's a tongue twister, huh? I'm sorry, I'm gonna need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous Walrus, the Bulbous Walrus. The name your price tool, only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose coxswain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates price and coverage match limited by state law. Me, 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 but also you. <laughs> the Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film, Pip, 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 Powder Donut. <clears throat> okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the name your price tool from Progressive. Oh man, that's a tongue twister, huh? I'm sorry, I'm gonna need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous Walrus, the Bulbous Walrus. The name your price tool, only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose coxswain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates price and coverage match limited by state law. Welcome, change agents, to your go-to place for stories that ignite your spirit, fuel your purpose, and connect us all. We believe in the incredible power of the human spirit, its boundless resilience, and the inspiration it brings to our lives. On the Driving Change podcast, we'll journey together through the extraordinary yet very relatable experiences of some of the most amazing people on earth. Our mission? That through these stories, we might just spark change within you and awaken a newfound motivation to harness your unique gifts to make a real difference in the world. So get ready to be inspired and join us on this incredible adventure. You can find the Driving Change Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever you love listening to your favorite podcasts.